By now, you may recognize this volcano. It's Mauna Kea in Hawaii, and I'm standing at an altitude of 13,600 feet. From here, the view is superb. Mauna Kea is majestic and dormant, we hope. Nothing much grows at this height, and the weather can be very changeable. In the distance, I can see the crest of the twin peak, Mauna Loa, which is still active. And lava from another volcano, Kilauea, frequently covers many of the roads on Big Island. The actual crest of Mauna Kea, at 13,796 feet, is over there, actually slightly higher than the telescopes. The reason I'm not actually at the summit is because I'm near the dome of the largest telescope ever built, the Keck. It's operational, and although not complete, it's already the most powerful telescope in the world. The dome is unlike many of the others here at Mauna Kea, but then the Keck is an exceptional instrument. Indeed, at the moment, it's unique. The name, incidentally, comes from the W.M. Keck Foundation, an American institution which gave $70 million for the telescope, and that is 75% of the total cost. The dome is huge. It's 101 feet high and 122 feet wide, and the total moving weight is 700 tons. This is the telescope. It's quite unlike the famous Palomar 200-inch reflector, or the new technology telescope at Chile, or any other telescope for that matter. And that is because the mirror, 10 meters or 33 feet in diameter, is not a single piece of glass. With a diameter of 396 inches, it's almost twice the size of the Palomar telescope. And you couldn't make a single piece of glass to that size. So the mirror of the Keck is made up of 36 segments, of which 12 are already in position. And these have to be aligned to the optical curve by a control system accurate to a millionth of an inch, and that's a thousand times thinner than a human hair. The telescope structure is 81 feet high, and together with the mirror, the total weight is 300 tons. The total light collecting area of the mirror is 818 square feet. Incidentally, the weight of glass in the mirror is only 14.4 tons, and that compares with 41 tons for this single 236 mirror of the Russian telescope at Zelenchuksky. Remember, when this telescope is completed, it will be much the most powerful in the world. It will see incredibly faint objects, so far away that we are now observing them as they used to be when the universe was young. It will be able to peer into the areas where stars are being born using infrared techniques. In fact, the power of this telescope seems to be almost limitless. But of course, setting it up is a really daunting business. My first involvement goes back to 1981 uh, at a large telescope conference in, in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, I met with Jerry Nelson, who had been uh, leading the scientific uh, program to, to design the telescope. And uh, we had a long talk out in the hallway of, at that conference about how to organize and manage a project like this. And Jerry was trying to get some advice. Uh, and after that conversation, uh, I kept in touch with Jerry. And uh, in 1983, the University of California came to me and asked me if I would uh, actually manage the project for them. And I started consulting for them full time at that, at that time and started doing the original planning and cost estimating budgeting for the project. Were there any skeptics to begin with? People who said, it just can't be done? Well, there, there were and there still are. There are still people who don't really think that it works. But there are lots of people who didn't believe that a segmented mirror telescope could be uh, made to work properly. Technically, I think a lot of people thought it was just too big a challenge. Uh, but I think the people who understand how it works and the details of the mechanisms that make it work are confident in the telescope. We're at almost 14,000 feet. What problems does that cause? Well, it causes uh, construction problems. It causes all kinds of problems. Uh, there, there are two things that you notice when you're at altitude. Uh, the first thing you notice is that you're a little short of breath and you get tired very easily. And the second thing you don't notice right away, but after a while you notice, is that your brain doesn't function as well here. And so your thinking process, uh, how you solve problems, your planning, all suffer greatly at altitude. And that, that reflects itself both in the construction of the telescope and in the testing. And even for astronomers working at, at high altitude, they often uh, 
forget what they're doing or are not able to adapt to changing circumstances very well. So all the working out has to be done at sea level? Yes, we try to do everything we can at sea level so that we have a well-organized plan for the people up here. But even so, it, it tends to get derailed very easily and, and people get distracted and we have to uh, keep the communication lines open all the time. Have there been any particular unexpected problems? I would say the most unexpected problem is not a problem per se, but just the level of activity here is much slower than we expected it to be. That is, the installation and testing and, and making all the pieces of the telescope work is taking a lot longer than we thought it would. And that's, that's related to the altitude problem also. But the, and also the fact the telescope is more complicated than we thought it was going to be when we designed it. The telescope saw first light on the 24th of November, 1990. Only nine of the segments were in place, but already the light grasp was equal to that of the Palomar reflector. The object studied was the galaxy NGC 1232, and of course, the latest electronic device that we used. From the start, the driving force behind the whole project has been Dr. Jerry Nelson. Well, Jerry, this is an amazing telescope, and of course, it's entirely new. How hard was it for you to decide on the segmented pattern for the mirror? Early on, I decided, this was a long time ago, back in 1977, uh, I decided that it would be interesting and valuable to the University of California to design a 10-meter telescope. And so I looked into ways we might build a telescope of that size, and I rapidly came to the conclusion that a monolithic mirror, that is a single piece of glass for the primary, would not work at this size. That's the way virtually all other telescopes have been built. And I decided that was impractical due to the difficulties in acquiring the glass and in properly supporting it. And the alternative then was segmented. And we've been building mosaic floor tiles for many, many centuries. And so the idea of making a mosaic is not novel at all, of course, but it is novel to astronomy. As the mirror is made in segments, normal mirror grinding can't be used until you bend the segments. Now, you invented this system. How does it work? Well, what happened, we realized that since our mirrors are far away from spheres and far away from axisymmetric things, conventional polishing techniques wouldn't work. And we sought out approaches to solve that problem and decided on this approach where we would deform the mirror blank elastically and then polish it into a spherical shape. And we realized that very simple applied forces could deform the mirror from a sphere into the shape we wanted, or vice versa, such that one could then polish a sphere, a very simple shape, into the mirror, and then remove the externally applied forces, the spherically polished optical surface, would then elastically relax into the desired piece of the parabolic primary. We've been stressed mirror polishing mirrors now. We've done over 30 of them. And we've tested a number of them over a period of time, and they seem to retain their shape to within our measurement accuracy over the period of a year or two that we've measured them. Other pieces of the same material have been demonstrated to be stable over much longer periods of time. You use something called a whiffle tree. What exactly is that? A whiffle tree is not an astronomical term at all, actually. <laughs> whiffle trees were traditionally used to tie horses to wagons. They're simply the bars that allow two horses to pull a wagon, and it forces each horse to carry its fair share of the load. Um, it's also a teeter-totter is the same idea. And for us, we use whiffle trees to support each mirror segment. Our mirror segments are thin. They're only about three inches thick. So they're very flexible under the forces of gravity. To keep us from experiencing those deformations, we actually support each mirror segment on 36 individual points. And those individual points are connected together with teeter-totters or whiffle trees down to three points, three defining points, which is where our actuators are attached. Now, that, of course, is the passive system. What about the active system? The active system consists of three actuators for each segment, which is capable of moving the mirror in tip, tilt, and piston in and out. A set of sensors, which is capable of measuring where the segments are relative to each other. And then, of course, a computer actuated control system, a mathematical algorithm, which takes the sensor readings and from those determines where the mirrors ought to be and then sends the commands out to these actuators to push them around small amounts. With 36 mirror segments, there are 3 times 36, 108 actuators that support all of those mirror segments. And it turns out 168 
displacement sensors that measure these very small differences between the neighboring segments. I take it this is going to be more accurate than any previous system. The optical requirements for this telescope, I think, are tighter than virtually any other telescope that's been built. Um, and of course, the active control system, which is unique to this telescope, um, had to be specified to correspondingly tight tolerances. The tight tolerances are done largely because Mauna Kea is probably the best site in the world, where the images are as small as they can be found any place. And of course, we want the telescope optics to be better than the best atmospheric conditions will allow. So we want the images to always be limited by the atmosphere. Well, what were your reactions at first light? We were just overjoyed. This is a very sophisticated instrument, of course, and with many, many new ideas in it, and lots of old ideas that are still very complicated things to implement. And so we were really happy when, with a very modest amount of labor on the order of a few weeks of work, we managed to get excellent first light images with image quality of a half an arc second, and all of the really critical things seemed to work the way they were supposed to. Up to now, have you come across any problems that are going to be very hard to solve? We have been, in fact, spending the last several months working on our drive and control system, a perfectly traditional problem that all telescopes have to deal with. And so in that context, we're not worried about it, but it's been very time consuming. This is the problem of just getting the telescope to point where you want it and to move very, very smoothly. That's not fundamentally new and different for this telescope, and so it'll just be resolved in the course of time. Which problems were the worst, the optical or the mechanical? I think the optical problems have been the, have been the most difficult ones. The electronic problems, the active control system, were the problems that I think had the most skeptics. But those of us who were working on these problems saw that the optical problems would be the, the hardest ones. What kinds of research are going to be done? I think the major emphasis will be on cosmological issues, looking at extra, doing extragalactic astronomy, looking back to the early universe. What did galaxies look like? What are the quasars out there? How did galaxies evolve to be the way they are as we see them in our near neighborhood? In short, how did the universe evolve from the original Big Bang into its present state? Another large effort that I think will go on, which will involve the infrared aspects of astronomy, will be, to look for, to, will be to study stellar evolution, the early stages of stellar evolution. How do they form? How do stars condense out of clouds of gas and dust? Um, how do planets and rings form around these protoplanetary systems with stars in the center? Will the Keck outrank any Earth-based telescope? Um, it's certainly our intention that it should. Uh, we expect to have an image quality um, which is unbeatable and better than almost any other telescope other than perhaps a couple on Mauna Kea here and a collecting area which far exceeds any other telescope. Absolute state-of-the-art instrumentation. And so for virtually all astronomical problems, we expect there will be no competition. All this is staggering enough, but there's more to come. In April 1991, the Keck Foundation gave a further grant of $75.4 million for the construction of a second telescope, a twin, to be set up in a dome 280 feet from the present one. Well, why, you may ask? Will two telescopes be better than one? And the answer is yes, because they can be used together. The principle is called interferometry. Keck 2 should be ready in the mid-1990s. And eventually, it and Keck 1, working together, should be capable of achieving resolution far greater than anything previously attempted. By putting two 10-meter uh, telescopes 85 meters apart, we gain the effect of having a mirror that was, in fact, 85 meters in diameter in terms of the spatial or angular resolution with, with, with which we can view the sky. One of the advantages of interferometry is it allows you to remove the effects of, of the atmosphere. The atmosphere moves the stellar image around and blurs it out over a circle. But uh, an experiment was done with the five meter uh, telescope on, uh, on Palomar Mountain. We took the mirror and blanked it off so that only small apertures were remained, so that we in effect had a number of smaller telescopes separated by about five meters. We then combined the light from those small, uh, separate little telescopes using interferometry and improved the angular resolution by almost a factor of 100 by that technique, so that we could see buried inside of this blurry image two tiny images which were binary stars orbiting about each other.
Presumably, you'll use KEC1 and KEC2 as an interferometer. Yes, we will be connecting them together in, uh, in, in such a way that, for instance, we could actually uh, separate two auto headlights at a distance of 16,000 miles. That's quite something. And can you extend that system to other telescopes on Mauna Kea, or elsewhere for that matter? Well, eventually, uh, we would hope that we might have some other smaller telescopes to, uh, to add into the system. And if, uh, in some time in the future, the fiber optic connection between telescopes becomes possible, then, of course, we could expand it to still other telescopes on Mauna Kea. What about the 8-meter telescope plan for Mauna Kea? Yes, right uh, adjacent to the Keck site, uh, the Japanese will be building an 8-meter telescope, and so it would be an obvious candidate if the fiber optic connection uh, can, be, uh, can be worked out. What would you say is the main advantage of the Mauna Kea site? There are two principal advantages. Number one, the atmosphere here is very, very steady, so that the blurring of the stellar image is very, very minim minimum compared to any, uh, any of the other observatories. And second, we're very high, so that most of the water vapor is below us. That means that the infrared radiation more easily reaches our telescopes than if we were deeper in the atmosphere. The Keck telescope is entirely revolutionary, and there are advantages to using many small mirrors. Yes, we have 36 hexagons, each about six feet across, which make up the 10-meter uh, mirror. And we have six pairs so that we can essentially coat those six, uh, recoat them with aluminum uh, without uh, disturbing the run of the telescope. When they're ready, then during the day, replace six dirty ones. In view of what you've learned from Keck 1, are you planning any major optical modifications for Keck 2? We're not planning any major modifications. We are considering the possibility of coating the mirrors with silver rather than aluminum. Uh, we haven't made that decision yet. One advantage of that is that that makes the mirror better for infrared astronomy than if it's coated with aluminum. Do you think this will far outrank any other Earth-based telescope? Well, one way to, to look at it is uh, the Palomar 200-inch telescope, which is currently the most powerful of effective telescope, can observe galaxies about halfway back to the Big Bang, about 8 billion years back if the Big Bang was 15 billion years ago. With the first Keck, we'll be able to look back about 12 billion years, that is a mere 3 billion years after the Big Bang. When both of them operate in tandem, we'll be able to look back to within the first to second billion years after the Big Bang, when we think galaxies actually began to form. And I must ask you this, how will the Keck telescopes compare with the Hubble Space Telescope? Well, they really work in a very, uh, very uh, good way, in the sense that the Hubble telescope, uh, when we get the new camera up in 1993, will have much sharper images because it's above the atmosphere, but it has a much smaller mirror. So the Keck telescope will be able to collect a great deal more light on the same very dim, very remote objects, and therefore be able to measure their redshift, that is to measure how fast they're moving and therefore how far away they are, and therefore how far back in time we're looking. Already, Mauna Kea has become the most revolutionary observatory in the world. There are great telescopes here, but the newest of them all is the Keck. And from the summit of this old volcano, the great telescope will be used to probe the furthest outposts of the universe. <laughs>